So far, in this course, we've only been talking about one moral theory, utilitarianism. And now, finally, we get a competing moral theory, and that's the moral theory of Immanuel Kant. Kant is a massive figure in the history of philosophy. Uh, he was from Prussia, and his moral theory, which is only part of his much grander philosophical outlook, um, his moral theory goes under several different names, but one of the most common labels that's used for it is the deontological moral theory, or deontology. The word deontic uh, just means relating to duty. So it's the study of duty is what deontology means. It's not a very helpful label for our purposes, so you can mostly ignore it. It's important to note that we didn't actually read the writing of Kant himself. Kant's writing is very difficult, uh, even after it's been translated from the original German, and in an introductory level course like this, it made a lot more sense to read uh, a summary of sorts or a reworking of Kant's ideas by a very established philosopher, Onora O'Neill. What we got from O'Neill in the reading for today was a presentation of Kant's you know, central moral principle. So just like with utilitarianism, there was the principle of utility, so too in Kant's moral theory, there is a principle, a famous principle that he calls the categorical imperative. Now, the categorical imperative, let's just go through the phrase for a minute. Categorical just means unconditional. It's, a, it's something that applies all the time. An imperative just means a command or something that you must do. So the idea is just that, well, this is a principle of morality that applies to everyone everywhere, and it says what they should or shouldn't do. There are all sorts of different formulations of the categorical imperative, and these formulations are actually not equivalent to one another, although they're supposed to be equivalent to one another. So O'Neill just focuses on one of these formulations, and that is the formula of the end in itself. The formula of the end in itself, well, we're going to get to Kant's own way of phrasing or stating this formula or this categorical imperative in a minute, but the very simple way to put it is like this. Never use a person as a mere means. That's my statement of the formula of the end in itself, which is a version of the categorical imperative. Okay, whatever. The principle is this. This is supposed to be, according to Kant, something that morality tells all of us. This is the central principle, or one of them, at least. Never use a person as a mere means. What we're going to do right now is we're going to unpack this. We're going to figure out what it means. What is it to use a person as a mere means? In order to understand this, we're going to need to understand what Kant means by the term maxim. Okay, so a maxim for Kant, at least according to O'Neill, is a kind of intention. Right, so we understand what an intention is, right? When you intend to do something, that's when you have a little mental plan of what you're going to do. If I intend to eat a tuna sandwich for lunch, well, that's a state of my mind. I have this plan for myself in the future. My intention includes several details. It applies only to me. I'm intending to do it. I'm intending that I eat the sandwich. I'm intending to eat a particular sandwich, the one that I packed at home and put in the refrigerator near my office or whatever, right? And I'm, per and I'm intending to, to execute this action at a certain time, approximately midday. I'm planning to eat this tuna sandwich. So there's all sorts of details in this intention. If you subtract those details, you subtract the details about who's going to perform the action and when they're going to perform it, maybe a few other details. If you subtract those details, then you get what Kant would call a maxim. A maxim is a kind of general intention. So, Whereas my intention is an intention for me to eat a tuna sandwich, 
at about midday today, a particular tuna sandwich, if we subtract some of those details, well then, the maxim might be for people to eat lunch. People in general, so we've subtracted me, we've subtracted the particular type of lunch, we've subtracted the day on which I'm gonna eat this tuna sandwich, and we're talking about days in general, and we get a general kind of, well, a general kind of plan. That's a maxim. A maxim is an intention minus some details. You could also think then of a maxim as a kind of rule. I mean, that might be what rules are or what a certain kind of rules are anyway. So now we know what a maxim is. Stock this away in your mind. Hold on to that for a minute. We're going to turn back to this. Never use a person as a mere means. The word mere is super important. So, to understand how important it is, let's take it out for a minute and see what changes. What is it to use a person as a means? Well, that's when you, when you engage in an interaction with someone in a way that, you know, gets you something from that. You're using them to get something else. So the example that O'Neill gives is of an interaction that you might have with a bank teller. Right, so here's the, here's the bank teller. The bank teller uh, is behind like the counter, you know, at the bank, and they got the money there. Here's the money. Uh, oh gosh, okay, yeah, there's the money. Anyway, there's the bank teller. And you walk in, here's you. There you are. Okay, now, you're just interacting with this person in order to get your money out of the bank. It's your money that you want out of the bank. And so you say, hello, I would like to make a withdrawal from my checking account or something like that. And you give them your checking account number or something like that. You're using them to get something else. That's using them as a means, as a way of getting something else, a means or a way to get something else. And indeed, they're using you as a means. They are standing behind the desk at the bank so that you can come and take your money out and so that they can get paid a salary for doing so. This is using a person as a means. And Kant says it's fine. There's nothing wrong with using a person as a means. This isn't something that the categorical imperative prohibits. This is a perfectly fine interaction. The problem is when you use a person as a mere means. You use them only as a means. So the question is, what is that? Here's what O'Neill says it is. To use someone as a mere means is to involve them in a scheme of action to which they could not, in principle, consent. Okay, so think about the bank teller example. The scheme of action, that's a, scheme just means type of action. We could, scheme of action, I think here, O'Neill simply means maxim. It's a type of interaction that both people could, well, they could agree to, right? The bank teller, you come in and you take out money from your own account in a way that you're permitted to do. That's something that the, uh, that the bank teller would agree to or could agree to if they understood the circumstances. And in the normal you know, situation, they do understand the circumstances. And the same with you on the other end, right? You would agree to this scenario where the bank uses your money, right, invests it or lends it so that it can make money and then it pays some of that money to the bank teller in the form of a salary. That's fine. You agree to that. That's, and, and that's certainly something you could agree to. So both parties could agree, could consent, could accept this type of interaction. And so therefore, right, this is not a case where you're using someone as a mere means. Using someone as a mere means is to, well, engage in some scheme of action, right, or act in a way under a plan, minus the details, act under an intention whereby if the person that you're interacting with knew of this intention, then this is a type of action that they could never agree to. They would never agree to it. O'Neill gives an example. Here's the example. One person may make a promise to another with every intention of breaking it. If the promise is accepted, 
then the person to whom it was given must be ignorant of what the promiser's intention, maxim, really is. Okay, this is the example, right? So someone makes what's called an insincere promise. I promise to, I don't know, go to your ballet recital or something like that, knowing all along that I'm not going to show up. That's an insincere promise. Now here's the thing. The other person, the person to whom I made the promise, you, let's say it's you, you're going to rely on my being there. Maybe you're going to tell some people that I'm going to be there. You're going to act under the assumption that I will be there, right? If you knew that my promise was insincere, then you, well, you would not have relied on me, right? This maxim, this general intention, the intention of, well, saying that I'm going to be somewhere and then not ever planning to be there, that maxim is something that you would never agree to. You would never go along with this scheme. This is something that you would never, well, in principle, consent to. You would never do it. So, the thought goes, this is an example where I, as the insincere promiser, am using you as a mere means. So now we're in a place where we can interpret this statement, this very sort of pithy little statement of the formula of the end in itself, according to O'Neill. Here's how you tell if an action is prohibited by this principle. You gotta, well, you gotta do it in steps. Step one, figure out the maxim that the action is based on. So you've gotta figure out what the intention of the person you know, performing that action is, and then you've gotta subtract out some details. So in the case of my insincerely promising to attend your ballet recital, right, the intention is that I'm going to make you think that I'm gonna do something and then I'm not gonna do it. That's my intention, right? That's subtracting out some of the details. It subtracts out the detail of it being a ballet recital, a particular ballet recital happening at a particular time on a particular date. It subtracts out all those details, right? And leaves the sort of general intention left over. So you figure that out. You figure out what the intention of the person is. In a certain way, this moral theory is the intention and consent-based moral theory. You can think of it that way. So it's the intention that matters. That'll come back in a minute. All right, so you figure out the maxim, and then step two. Step two is ask whether everyone involved could possibly consent to behavior based on that maxim. Actually, the second step is the last step. Take the maxim whereby I convince you that I'm going to do something, I promise to do it without ever intending to do it. Is that something that everyone would agree to? This scheme of action or you know, behaving in this way? Well, no. The other people would never agree to be uh, insincerely promised to. If they knew that the promise was insincere, they would never agree. So the answer that we get to this question could everyone involved possibly consent to the behavior based on this maxim? The answer that we get in this example is no. Well, according to this principle then, that behavior is prohibited. If, however, the answer that we get to the question is yes, that's the sort of thing that everyone involved could consent to or could agree to. Well, in that case, then this principle says that that behavior is permitted. Notice that I just said permitted, right? It doesn't mean that that action is great. You know, going to the bank, for example, and uh, taking some money out of your checking account, or, I don't know, um, saying a quick goodbye to someone before you leave, or whatever, a million other actions that you could engage in that don't violate this principle. Some of those are good, and some of them are less good, but they're all permitted. They're all good enough according to this principle. That's gonna be important. It's certainly gonna be important when we're comparing Kant's moral theory to utilitarianism, the theory that we have been talking about previously. Notice that 
This kind of moral theory, a moral theory that's centered around a principle like this, never use a person as a mere means, that is, never act under a maxim which could not, in principle, be accepted by everyone. A moral theory based on that principle will actually get very different results when it comes to the sorts of cases that we were already talking about when we were talking about utilitarianism. Do you remember this example? It was a sheriff example. Sheriff? Is that how you spell sheriff? It was a sheriff example in some reading by a philosopher named uh, J.J.C. Smart. Smart? I forgot the R. There. Okay. Remember, that was just an example where there's a mob of angry people. They think that someone is guilty of a terrible crime. And they're going to riot. And the riot will be violent. And many innocent people will die in the riot. But the person that they thought that committed the crime is also innocent. The mob is wrong. And you're the sheriff, and you know all this. And you have to decide, okay, do I frame this innocent person in order to prevent the riot? Or do I not frame an innocent person and, and then the riot will occur and very bad things will happen as a result? Utilitarianism, you may remember, said, well, look, just calculate how much uh, pain both of these actions will result in. And they're both going to result in pain, not pleasure. No option is good. Framing an innocent person is not good. And uh, letting a riot occur is not good either. So it's going to be pain on either side. And just figure out which one, which, which action produces less pain, and that's the action that you are morally required to do. That was utilitarianism, not deontology. According to this theory, you should never use a person as a mere means. You should never act on a general intention or a maxim that everyone involved, you know, would not potentially or in principle agree to. And that's surely the case in the sheriff example. The person who you would frame could never agree, could never consent to the form of action of framing someone, framing them for a crime. And actually the mob as well. The folks in the mob, right, they don't want you to frame someone. They want justice, what they think is justice. So very few people actually could ever consent to this kind of action, framing an innocent person in order to prevent, you know, a mob. And therefore, deontology, it seems, at least on O'Neill's presentation, right, Kant's theory, it seems, gets the result that's opposite to the one given by utilitarianism, namely that the sheriff must not frame the innocent person. Let me just emphasize one thing. This is sort of the consent-based theory of morality, but keep in mind, what's important here is not actual consent in the real world, right? It's not that everyone has to consent to everything. If that was the case, then this moral theory would say that you can't do anything, even in private, that other people don't agree to. So, you know, you have some private sexual practice that you like to engage in, or some television show that you like to watch on your own. There might be some people out there who think, that activity isn't good. I don't agree. I don't consent to that person privately doing that thing. If you misunderstand the categorical imperative, you might think that the categorical imperative says, well, then you can't do it. You can't engage in this private sexual practice or watch this television show that you like and other people disapprove of or whatever. But that's a misunderstanding. The claim here is not that everyone has to consent to every action. It's just that once you take the general form of the action, and that's different from the particular action itself, once you take the general form of the action, is it something that possibly people could agree to? Could everyone in principle agree that people can engage in whatever activities give them pleasure and don't harm others? Yes, everyone could agree to that. In which case, uh, well, you engaging in this private sexual practice would not be using someone as a mere means. Okay, let's end by doing this. Let's just do a little quick comparison of utilitarianism and Kantian deontology, just so that we can see how these theories line up against one another. Okay, the first big difference is just about 
what these moral theories care about. What they say matters to whether some action is good or bad. According to utilitarianism, what determines the goodness or badness of an action are its consequences, and particularly the aggregate utility. So, you want to know whether some action is good or bad? Focus on what results from that action, and particularly how much total happiness or utility results. Very different in the Kantian case. What matters is not the results of an action, but the intention of the person acting. What they're trying to do. That's a huge difference. And also, in particular, what we want to know about that intention is whether it's something that in principle um, enough people could consent to. So, these theories focus on very different things about actions in order to, to determine or to give a ruling about whether those actions are right or wrong. Okay, so in the utilitarian case, I have written, in all cases, some action is required. Nothing is supererogatory. You may remember the word supererogatory. Uh, supererogatory is the philosophical technical term for good but not required. Something is supererogatory if it's over and above your duty, but it is a good thing to do, right? Like if you just randomly decide, hey, I'm gonna bring so-and-so a donut because I know they like donuts. It's not their birthday, I didn't promise to bring them a donut, but I know it would make their day great, so here you go, here's a donut. That's not something you were required to do, but it was really nice. What a nice thing. That's super erogatory, it's extra. According to utilitarianism, nothing is super erogatory. In every case, there's some action that will produce the greatest total of pleasure minus pain. And so you must do that action in every case. In every case, some action is required. Nothing is sort of optional, according to utilitarianism. It's different in the Kantian case, right? Some behavior is prohibited, namely behavior that uses a person as a mere means. Everything else is optional. Some actions are supererogatory, right? So, there's all sorts of different ways to not use a person as a mere means. And then among those cases, some actions are better than others, right? So in particular, Kant thinks that treating someone fully as an end in themselves is good, but it's not required. It's supererogatory, it's extra. In this sense, utilitarianism is kind of exhausting. Every time you act in any way, a thousand times a day, 10,000 times a day, you're making choices and, well, in each case there's something you must do and everything else is prohibited. In the Kantian case, it's like, look, there's, here's a whole bunch of stuff you can't do, but other than that, you have some freedom. And so it is less uh, demanding in that sense. Okay, here's the last difference. In the case of utilitarianism, there are few or no unbreakable universal principles. You might think that framing an innocent person for a crime is something that you should never do. That would be an unbreakable universal principle. Well, there is no principle like that built into morality according to the utilitarian. The utilitarian says, look, in general you shouldn't frame people for crimes, but in some specific circumstances, that might be the thing that you have to do, is frame someone for a crime. So there aren't these unbreakable universal principles. You have to judge every case anew. That's not the case according to Kant's moral theory. Kant's moral theory is all unbreakable universal principles. If some action uses a person as a mere means, then you can never do it. You can never make insincere promises. That's an unbreakable universal principle, according to Kant's moral theory. Kant's moral theory is just a whole bunch of stuff that you can absolutely never do. According to utilitarianism, there's nothing really that you can never do. You just have to be in the right circumstances where doing that thing will result in the greatest total of pleasure minus pain. Okay, that's it.